Come feel the noise. This is a new series. Following the success of my story of Psychedelia series, I decided to carry on and tell the stories of other popular music styles, focusing on the second half of the 20th century, when pop music was the main purveyor of the human spirit. Naturally, we shall start with the style that emerges the reaction to the world created in the wake of Psychedelia. If you have been following that series, here is where we go to the next phase. Welcome to the story of Glam. There is another reason why I feel urgency to tell the story of Glam before others. We live at a time when pop music has fallen from grace and no longer means what it used to. The new generations have no inner understanding of what it meant, and some of the elements that have been introduced into our culture in the rock and roll period have now been twisted into something rather ugly. And of all the rock and roll styles that have been twisted, glam hurt the worst. Many of the glam elements that were so cool, liberating and exciting at the time have now become oppressing and depressing, to the point where it's hard for me to enjoy listening to the 70s glam classics. I hope that through this series we can reconnect with that original spirit, remove the ugly mask that has been placed on it, and learn to enjoy it again. Now, I know what you're thinking. You are thinking that there is no way that the story of Glam will be as interesting, or as philosophically deep, as the story of Psychedelia. Well, I got news for you, we are going even deeper. So come up to the lab, and see what's on the slab. It's going to be a hell of a ride. The Glam sensibility emerged out of the rock world, initially as a rock music style. But it had antecedents. Glam is short for glamour and glamour existed long before rock and roll. Where did glam get its glamour from? Well, several sources, which we shall discuss in the course of this series. But the main source, the point which we are going to start from, is the golden age of Hollywood. The golden age of Hollywood begins after World War I, as movies became feature length, and as cinema emerged as a new art form. This was still the silent era meaning that actors had to express themselves through mime. And that meant that their gestures could be universally understood, turning cinema into the first truly universal art, with the same movies being watched and enjoyed the world over. Within this art, new methods were created, distinguishing it from the art of theatre. Movie cameras had the ability to do close-ups on the actors, meaning that the face would loom large over the movie theatre, and it was discovered that some actors had the ability to project something with their facial features and expressions, some inexplicable magic which had a powerful effect on the viewers. Actors that became stars, like Rudolf Valentino and Greta Garbo, mesmerized moviegoers, who treated them like gods. Gradually, the movie industry of Hollywood, on all its different studios, began to realize that movies are first and foremost about the stars. With the advent of talkies, in the late 1920s, the star system truly got into action. While silent films were often shot outdoors, talking movies initially had to be filmed in studio to achieve an acceptable sound quality. And within studio settings, directors had greater control over aesthetics, using the right lighting and camera angles to glamorize the stars to maximum effect. By the second half of the 30s, the technique of shooting in colors developed to a sufficient level enabling the glamorous stars to be shot in vivid technical. The palette and canvas were ready. Now, all that was left was for the studios to create the stars themselves. There were five big studios in Hollywood during the Golden Age, and several smaller ones. Every studio had its own stable of stars, and they were competing frantically with the other studios on discovering the next big star. When a new talent arrived, they would first do a screen test. One thing that they were asked to do was to act out a scene, but if they didn't manage to impress, it wasn't the end of the world. Acting abilities were not that important. The more important screen test was the personality test. The talent would be placed in front of the camera, and asked to do simple everyday things for a few minutes, 
like turn their head, smile, light a cigarette, etc. The test was, does the camera expose some kind of inner magic in their personality? Something that will charm the audience. If it did, then they were star potential. If not, they were useless. Here's an example. In 1939, a young Swedish actress was asked to do a personality screen test for Selznick International Pictures. And with these few seconds of magic, a star was born. This was the secret of the stars. They had to radiate something, and that something had to be caught on celluloid. That last part is important. Some people have a shining personality, but on film they are boring. Whereas with some people the camera captures something that you don't see in person. In the case of Ingrid Bergman, it is obvious. You can just imagine David Oselznik's eyes turning into dollar signs once he saw this footage. With other candidates, you needed an eye for discovering the inner star, and this was the challenge that you had to be to become a successful studio. In other words, the main creative process in classic Hollywood was in creating a star. Once the studio execs decided that someone had star potential, the studio started to groom them. Ingrid Bergman didn't need much work, as she was already an accomplished actress who played in Swedish films, and an unblemished beauty but this guy needed quite a lot of work to become this star. Besides physical improvements, these Pygmalions had to go through many other changes, whatever the studio deemed necessary. Name change, posture and diction lessons, acting lessons, as well as learning how to dance, sing, horseback ride, fence and more. Then, the studio would try them out in different roles in movies, until they would find a role that would bring out the magic, and win over the movie-going audience. Once this happened, the persona of the star was fixed, and they were destined to play it in every movie they would make from now on. The movies they played in were tailor-made for that persona, and everything else revolved around it. Today, we perceive the art of movie making very differently, and we see the director as the main creative force. The directors are often the writers and editors of their movies, and oversee every part of the production. In the golden age of Hollywood, the directors, screenwriters and editors were just employees who were there to work together on a product which a studio wanted them to make, and the movies that they made would be vehicles for the stars. Every movie would feature their persona, presenting a different variation on it, but never breaking its boundaries. For the audience, this persona was what they came to see, and they would not forgive transgressions. When you watch Cary Grant, Betty Davis, John Wayne or Lorraine Bacall, you don't see them as the people that they are portraying. You see them as Cary Grant, Betty Davis, John Wayne and Lorraine Bacall. There is still a little bit of that in today's Hollywood. From the early 90s onward, Arnold Schwarzenegger and Julia Roberts were destined to play the persona that the audiences fell in love with in Terminator 2 and Pretty Woman, and their movies were tailor-made for that persona. But, Schwarzenegger aside, in this version of Hollywood it is not due to the limited acting abilities of the stars. Since the 1950s, most Hollywood actors take pride in their acting abilities, and want to be more versatile, and movie makers and goers care more about the acting. The more common thing for contemporary stars is that they have a persona, but are not afraid to play other roles as well. Samuel L. Jackson and Tom Cruise are examples for actors who play a large range of characters, but occasionally they will go back and play Samuel L. Jackson and Tom Cruise, the personas that they established in Pulp Fiction and Top Gun. Those contemporary stars give us some idea of what the star system was like, but only in a very superficial manner. Because the stars of the golden age of Hollywood did not exist just on screen. A big part of the studio was the publicity department, 
designed to feed the public stories about their favorite stars, glamorizing their private lives and making it seem like they are their persona in real life as well. Part of this process was creating a fictional biography for the stars, telling their story before they came to Hollywood. But this biography did not glamorize them. On the contrary, it emphasized that they came from common origins, just like the readers of the magazines that printed these stories. The idea was that the stars represented the real essence of the actor, which was hidden in them until Hollywood came and allowed it to shine. And if they can do it, then so can you. You also have a star in you. You just have to find a way to make it shine. Thus, Hollywood exported American individualism to the world. What is glamour? What is that quality that the stars project? No one can fully answer this question. We just feel that they have an effect on us. But there are some defining characteristics. One of them is androgyny, which you can find in many of the stars. Androgyny broke the rules in a world that was still dominated by distinct gender roles, and was therefore edgy and sexy. For female stars, androgyny added toughness and aggressiveness. At a time when women started to step out of the kitchen and take part in previously male dominions, the female stars showed the way with their attitude. For male stars, a touch of androgyny added a sense of style. Style has always been something that belonged only to the high class aristocrats, but in the 20th century, as the lower classes started to have time and money to dress up, it became more general. Regular people began to express themselves through their clothes, and the Hollywood stars showed the way. Of course, not all stars were androgynous. Within this new world of stylish men and outgoing women, Hollywood could offer new models of masculinity and femininity. In a broader sense, the Hollywood stars covered the range of human personalities, showing how every personality type can be unique and glamorous. The stars, then, were role models to follow, extensions of your own personality. And with cinema being a universal art form, they affected people all over the world. Everyone had the star that they idolized, the one that spoke to something in them, and by emulating that star they could make their own inner star shine. The publicity departments were also in charge of seeing to it that nothing would tarnish the image of the stars. The stars were always ordered what to say in interviews, not allowed to express their own views and personalities, and their private life was shrouded by the publicity machine. Thus, they were distanced from the public, becoming unattainable gods and goddesses. If a star got themselves into a bad or embarrassing situation, the publicity department saw to it that the story would be buried. They had enormous power, but sometimes, even they couldn't do anything. Remember this star? Well, she could not be saved. After a glorious decade in Hollywood, Ingrid Bergman fell in love with the Italian director Roberto Rossellini, and became pregnant with his baby. If that wasn't bad enough, she was already married to another man at the time. 1950s America could not forgive such a scandal, and Bergman was denounced on the floor of the US Senate and banished from Hollywood. Ingrid was on her way out anyway. The attraction she felt towards Rossellini wasn't just a romantic one. After the war, Roberto Rossellini emerged as the main exponent of what was known as Italian neorealism, which was the stark opposite of Hollywood cinema. Neorealist directors regarded themselves as artists, not as servants for star making and they aspire to show reality as it is, stripped of any glamorization. Their films showed life in all its brutality, and those years were nothing if not brutal. They did not focus on individually stars, but on communities of people trying to survive. Stylistically, they were shot outdoors, in the ruins of post-war Europe, and for secondary roles they used people who were not professional actors, but local residents. As a result, the movies were less polished than Hollywood features, but felt more authentic. Ingrid Bergman was one of the people drawn to that authenticity, and after she divorced her husband, she married Rossellini and started to act in his movies. In the decade after the war, the worlds of realism and glamour stood in opposition to one another, and you had to choose where your loyalties lie. Neorealist films weren't entirely a representation of reality, of course. They had a script, a fictional story to work from. Rossellini relied mainly on the talents of a young writer named Federico Fellini, whose talent for storytelling was already becoming renowned. In the 50s, Fellini started to direct movies himself, and by the middle of the decade he was the new star of Italian cinema. But his cinema was no longer neorealist. 
Although he maintained many of its characteristics, shooting outdoors, highlighting the lives of the downtrodden, showing reality in its stark brutality, the stories were no longer about the social struggles of communities. Instead, they focused on individuals living unique lives, had a fairy tale dreamy feel, and showed the penchant for carnivalesque scenes. This incensed many people, especially in Italy. The country, at the time, was ruled by the right wing, which was no longer fascist but still very conservative, religious and authoritarian. The only alternative was the communist left, which regarded neo-realist cinema as a way to portray the lives of working people and make political statements. Both sides frowned at Fellini's movies, the former for the blasphemous and iconoclastic scenes contained in them, the latter for its so-called betrayal of the neo-realist mission to use art to push for social change. But Fellini was not interested in subjugating his art to politics. As someone who started his writing career under the fascist regime, he learned how to convey meaning in an ambiguous and ironic way, working his way around censorship. He adopted an apolitical stance, one that aspires to show the human condition without an underlying ideology, just art for art's sake. He didn't try to tell you what in reality is true and meaningful and what is fake and frivolous, but just took all different facets of reality and threw them together. His movies are open to many interpretations, but you feel that they do say something meaningful, something that touches you deep inside. And his approach proved to be more powerful, as his movies were enthusiastically accepted around the world, heralded as a new type of spiritualist cinema. In the second half of the 50s, things were beginning to look up. The Western world was finally getting out of the years of depression and war, into a new age of prosperity. American pop culture was now everywhere, injecting its youthful energy into the tired European spirit. In Rome, a vibrant and exuberant nightlife scene developed around Via Veneto Street, which became a favorite hangout for celebrities from all over the world. American movie stars would come to mingle with the local bohemians, and enjoy the different amusements the place had to offer. And, along with them, the place was swarming with journalists, who would inform their eager readers and viewers on every move these celebrities made. The public just couldn't get enough of gossip about them. This was nothing new. There was always gossip, and there have always been people who the public was fascinated with. But in the past, they were mainly aristocrats, born to high-class families and taught to behave in a vain way. This was a new aristocracy, an aristocracy made of regular people who rose to fame due to pop culture, and their vanity was shaped by Hollywood. The old aristocrats were forced to bow to this new world and play by its rules, and many of them also came to be a Veneto and mingled, ditching the old European decorum in favor of the sassy American style. This was the reality of the late 50s, and Fellini wanted to capture this reality. And this is exactly what he did in his 1960 movie, La Dolce Vita. La Dolce Vita follows the protagonist called Marcello, who is one of the journalists circling around via Veneto, trying to get scoops on the celebrities. The movie takes place almost entirely at night, trying to capture the hectic pace of the new nightlife. Seeping through all the vanity, the movie also deals with the kind of themes that typified neo-realist cinema, as Marcello is desperately trying to figure out how one can live an authentic life in this new reality. Watching the movie today, you realize that it is a question that we are still grappling with, all those years later. And this new reality contains some rather annoying phenomena. Wherever Marcello goes, he is usually accompanied by a busybody photographer friend, who tries to get photos of the celebrities. The name of his friend is... Paparazzo! Paparazzo! Paparazzo, Paparazzo is a representative of a new breed of photographers that was born at the time, a more aggressive type. Circling like buzzards around the celebrities, invading their private space, they would do anything to catch them in a moment that could be sold to newspapers, including trying to provoke reactions from them. It was one of the seedier sides of this new culture, and back then they did not have a name yet. Well, not until this movie was made, that is. After La Dolce Vita came out, Paparazzo became the official name for this type of photographer, and the paparazzi became one of the more irritating fixtures of pop culture. Early in the movie, Marcello and Paparazzo go to the airport to cover the arrival of an American movie star called Silvia, 
who is played by an actual movie star, Anita Ekberg. We see the media frenzy around her, and the way she handles it signals a shift in star behavior. The golden age of Hollywood was coming to an end, and the stars started to behave differently. This change can be summed up in one name, Marilyn Monroe. Marilyn Monroe is the last big star to be built in the classic Hollywood style. She moved from modeling to acting in the late 40s, and passed through several studios before she landed in 20th Century Fox. By 1953, the studio already discovered the character that made her a star. But Marilyn was different from the stars that came before. As someone who grew into the Hollywood era, she already internalized star behavior, and it was second nature to her. While previous stars had to toe the line that the studio set for them, and speak and act as they were instructed in their dealings with the press, Marilyn knew how to navigate and manipulate the press to advance her persona. And this change was necessary. In a world swarming with paparazzi, and with the advent of television, movie stars could no longer keep their distance to protect their image. To maintain the glamour, they had to keep the performance going in real life as well. Monroe embodied other changes, too. With the new age of prosperity, things were opening up, and the sexual revolution was afoot. Hollywood movies were slowly becoming more sexually daring. While previous female stars displayed their sexuality through their behavior, Marilyn started the game of showing more and more flesh in her movies, and in her answers to the press she knew how to provide just the right amount of titillation to keep the public aroused. Meanwhile, Hollywood was being affected by a new acting style created in American theater, known as method acting. For the new generation of young movie actors, glamour was no longer the main issue. They wanted to be good actors first. In the late 50s, Marilyn enrolled to study method acting, showing where the wind was blowing. The character of Sylvia perfectly displays this new type of star, and we see her effortlessly handling and tantalizing the media. Please, miss, dorme in pyjama or in camicia da notte? How do you sleep with pyjamas or night gone? Neither. I sleep only in two drops of French perfume. Solo con due gocce di profumo francese. Muy bien, madame, muy bien. Later, Marcello takes her out on town, where she shows her carefree and uninhibited American spirit. In a famous scene, she jumps into the Trevi Fountain, repeating an act that became notorious for American celebrities visiting Europe. Europe is full of great classic works of art, which the locals treat with reverence, but for the Americans they were just excuses for some irreverent behavior. The Fontana di Trevi in Rome is one of the greatest monuments of Baroque art, sacrosanct to the Romans. But for Sylvia it's just a thing of beauty that she has to become part of. Marcello is drawn to this attitude, so free of the traditions of the past, but he is left wondering if it has any substance to it. Marcello, come here! Hurry up! Si, Sylvia. Vengo anch'io. Ma sì, ha ragione lei, sto sbagliando tutto. Stiamo sbagliando tutto. Sì. Sì, io ma chi sei? Listen. Sylvia. On the next night, Marcello goes to a cafe where he runs into Nico. Marcellino, bruttissimo, cattivo, frocci, bene. Dove vai? A Bassano di Stucci, in un castello del mio fidanzato. Perché non mi ci porti? Oh sì. Senti, ti ha cercato paparazzo, voleva farti un servizio sul Jardin de Modo. Sì, ma io non faccio più fotografie di moda da un anno, basta. Nicolina! Eccola! Christa Pafgen, a.k.a. Nico, was a German model. Modeling, as a job, was undergoing a major revamping in those years. 
From anonymous girls who posed for painters or photographers, models became another expression of glamour, in a world that wanted to be like a Hollywood movie. By the early 60s, modeling agencies were opening up, and modeling became a career that could lead to pop stardom. Nico was a famous European model, and in La Dolce Vita she plays herself, adding yet another touch of glamour to the movie. So from neorealism, Fellini moved into creating a movie that was all about the fake life of celebrities. But is it really fake? Or maybe this is reality? Could it be that the world of La Dolce Vita holds some truth about what human society is really like? What humans are really like? This is a question that late 50s artists started to ask themselves. In America, a new breed of painters started to emerge, which at first were actually branded neorealists. The reason they were called that is that after years in which American painting was dominated by abstract expressionism, which looked nothing like the material world, these painters went back to painting real-life objects. But the objects that they painted weren't the objects that artists traditionally picked. Instead, they took images from the consumerist culture emerging from the affluent capitalist society. It was what these artists saw around them, and in that sense it was realism. But realism traditionally aspired not just to show everything that's in everyday reality, but to highlight the things about it that are real and everlasting. Since these new artists focused on the manufactured and the fleeting, the term neorealism didn't really fit. Some suggested it should be called neo-dada. The dada movement in art began during World War I, as a rebellion against modern culture. The dadaists mixed high art with what until then was considered non-art, presenting an unholy mix. In that, this new movement was indeed very much like Dada, as the objects that it chose to present were never considered worthy of art. But the Dadaists did it because the old hierarchies, which were supposed to create an enlightened society, have instead plunged the world into a bloody war. It was a political statement, rebelling against these old hierarchies and wishing to destroy them. This new movement was apolitical, and its mixing of art and non-art didn't feel like wanting to shatter the existing hierarchies. It had more of a carnivalesque feel to it, a celebration of the American society in which high culture could mingle with popular culture, commerce, consumerism, and everyday life. In a carnival there is no high and low, but people from all walks of life party together. This new art seemed to have that spirit, and thus, it wasn't Dada. So if it was neither neo-realism nor neo-Dada, what was it then? The answer actually came from Britain. In 1952, a group of young British artists got together to have philosophical discussions about art, and called themselves the Independent Group. In the mid-50s, they started to take interest in the craftsmanship of people who were designing commercial stuff like magazine ads, billboards, movie posters and leaflets, noting that they were displaying some pretty interesting aesthetics, and perhaps should be considered an art form in itself. This was an art that came straight out of popular culture, so they labelled it Pop art. At first, pop art simply meant those aestheticized everyday products. But at the same time, another process was taking place, as artists expressed the need to take fine art out of the galleries and museums and put it back on the streets. Popular culture and fine art started to blend, and it was getting hard to tell where one ended and the other began. The definition of pop art gradually shifted to refer to this new hybrid. In the late 50s, independent group member Richard Hamilton started to lead other members of the group to make plastic art that reflected this new world, in which artifact was art and art was artifact. This had an effect on the American so-called neo-dadaists, and the label pop art started to take root. Like Fellini, then, Hamilton saw new possibilities in the vibrant pop culture that came from America. Most other Europeans, however, were repelled by it as were those Americans who considered themselves as culturally refined as the Europeans. The culture guardians were vexed by the effect that this seemingly crass, uncivilized and vacuous culture had on the youth, and shuddered at the thought of allowing it to exist side by side with European fine art. They saw nothing of value in pop art, and in most other cultural artifacts that came from America. And when they wanted to express just how low it was, there was one word that they used, one American cultural artifact that you could compare all others to, to signify just how vulgar, stupid and barbaric you think it is. That word was rock and roll.
Red tape, gold and gold. I gotta get it all up so I'm Rock and roll was born in the early 50s, when America's white youth got tired of the wholesome and respectable white pop, and increasingly started to listen to the raw and uninhibited black pop styles, generally known as rhythm and blues. By the mid 50s, there were white bands that appropriated rhythm and blues and played it their way, a style that by 1955 became known as rock and roll. For the culture guardians, this was a catastrophic event. Black music accentuated the rhythm the very thing that European culture saw as the uncivilized side of music. The sight of white kids becoming enthralled by the rhythm was seen as a sign of degeneration, a sign that Western civilization is about to go back to its barbaric roots. But others could see that it had something more to it, an ecstatic exhilaration that seemed to be not just about letting go of all civilized norms and becoming an ape. In La Dolce Vita, rock and roll is played as a symbol of Sylvia's free spirit, getting her Italian hosts to shake loose of the old Catholic inhibitions. For the youth, worldwide, Rock and roll became a new religion, the center of the world. They couldn't explain why, but they knew that this music harbors a truth that seems more real than anything else society had to offer. A generational gap opened, between the older generations that regarded rock and roll as a menace to society, and the post-war youth that saw it as salvation from the boring conformism of the 50s. The former consoled themselves that it is just a fad that will soon pass, the latter believed that it will never die. For the music industry, rock and roll was just a fad that it needed to exploit. Even many of the white artists who were doing rock and roll were only in it for the money. Most of them covered the black songs in a way that played down the wildness and rawness, and made them more accessible to white ears. Another way was to make fun of them. The record that we are hearing is Little Darling, by a black band called the Gladiolas, that was released in January 1957. A month later, it was covered by a group of white preppies who called themselves the Diamonds, and they, basically, turned it into a joke. the desired hilarity, the Diamonds accentuated all of the aspects that mainstream culture considered to be ridiculous about rock and roll. The pounding rhythm, the raucous atmosphere, the cheesy lyrics, the gibberish backing vocals, the overdramatic singing, the screechy high voices. And the result? A massive hit, and one of the all-time classics of rock and roll. It turned out that rock and roll defied parody because it didn't take itself seriously to begin with. The kids knew that rock and roll was silly, but that silliness actually had a liberating effect, as it released them from the hold of the rationality of the time, a rationality which they felt was all wrong, but they couldn't explain why. With rock and roll, you didn't need to explain yourself. You just had to move to the ecstatic rhythm and sing the gibberish lyrics, and the liberating sensation would take over your body. The Diamond's version of Little Darlin, meant as a burlesque of rock and roll, actually highlighted the very attributes that were its essence, and thus was more rock and roll than the music that it parodied. Oh, it had a fantastic sound, didn't it? 
So rock and roll didn't take itself seriously, but it wasn't a joke either. They couldn't explain what it was, but the kids felt that it was saying something deep, and started to dig into it. First of all, they went beyond the white cover versions, and started to buy the black originals. While previous generations of white Americans regarded blacks as primitive people, those who are behind in human development and have a way to progress before they become as civilized as Europeans, this generation felt like they had a lot to learn from the blacks. Rock and roll was a big bang, destroying the old racial lines. For a brief moment during the late 50s and early 60s, the youth believed that they are on their way to create a post-racial world. Into this reality burst Chuck Berry, and provided the youth with exactly what it needed. An African American who was a little older than most rock and roll musicians, Berry knew how to turn the intuitions of the young generation into poetry, into rock and roll poetry. His songs dramatized teenage life, moving from schools to parties to first loves to youth activities. Most of all, his lyrics assured the kids that rock and roll is much more than just a fad. In fact, it is about to usurp all art that came before. As a lyricist, Barry was pure pop art, making poetry out of everyday mass-produced artifacts. Along with a few others, he paved the way to more sophisticated rock and roll. No one has ever written poetry quite like this before. They furnished off an apartment with a two-room robot sale. The cooler radar was crammed with TV dinners and ginger ale. By the early 60s, rock and roll was domesticated. The music industry recovered from its initial shock and realized that there's a lucrative new market in pop music aimed at teenagers. It was still a combination of black and white pop, but the wildness of the music was tame, and the lyrics and arrangements became more sophisticated. With the boyish looking John F. Kennedy in the White House, America felt young and fresh, and rock and roll was its soundtrack. And with Jackie Kennedy as the most glamorous first lady ever, it felt like the country finally became what it dreamt itself to be on its silver screens. America was experiencing La Dolce Vita, and in this world, pop art was all the rage. The best things in life are free, but you can give them to the birds and bees. I see. In the early 60s, pop art came into its own. The scene, centered in New York, drew its images entirely from the world of mass media, electric appliances, disposable assembly line products, company brands, advertisements, comic books, and every other aspect of popular culture. And it is not just the content that was drawn from popular culture, but the style as well. Many of the pop artists started out in the commercial world, and brought the techniques of that world into the realm of fine art to the chagrin of many culture guardians. Unlike most 20th century art movements that had an ideological and political manifesto, presenting an alternative to contemporary society, pop was apolitical and ambiguous. Worse, it seemed to erase the individual touch of the artist, and embrace the automation of the modern world. Some speculated that the pop artists were satirizing popular culture, but you couldn't tell. Just like with rock and roll, pop art was self-aware of its ridiculousness but relished those very aspects that the respectable people deemed ridiculous. Thus, it was at the same time satirizing and celebrating popular culture. The feeling in those years was that there was something in popular culture, something that goes deeper than what the culture guardians thought. And while the culture guardians were lamenting the death of art, pop art was enthusiastically embraced by the American public, and the images that it created became part of Kennedy's vibrant America.
Of all the pop artists, there was one who took it to its extreme conclusions and came to embody the whole movement. Like others in the movement, Andy Warhol started out as a commercial artist, designing ads for a shoe manufacturer. With the rise of pop art, he crossed over into the fine art world, and in the early 60s was already famous for painting products like Campbell's soup cans and Coca-Cola bottles. Furthermore, he shocked the media with announcements that made him seem like a pop art artifact himself, like announcing that he wants to be a machine, and that he loves monotony. He seemed to be suggesting that only the manufactured is real, while the organic is something we need to discard. In his interviews he spoke like a mindless robot, further enticing the public. Stylistically, he introduced the silkscreen technique, which allowed him to quickly reproduce images, making each just a little bit different from the other. Thus, he made his art automatic like a production line machine, while preserving a random element that gave it some individuality. This made sense when painting commodities, but when he did the same to classic works of art, he demystified art and seemed to suggest that it too is nothing but a product. In 1962 he moved into a Manhattan studio that he called The Factory, and went on blurring the boundaries between art and industry. More than any other pop artist, Warhol understood the importance of glamour to popular culture. Everything in the factory, the walls, ceiling, floor, pipes, furniture, etc., was all covered in silver foil, silver paint and pieces of mirror, giving it a look that was on the one hand futuristic and science fiction, and on the other hand narcissistic and nostalgic for the glory years of the silver screen. Right away, the place became a hotspot for eccentric figures, deviants who could not find a place in the conformist society of the time. Inspired by Hollywood, this gaggle of freaks, queers and wannabe stars developed unique and glamorous characters, including comic book nicknames, and lived their life as if they were starring in the movie. Warhol was fascinated by these people, coined the term superstars to define them, and welcomed them into the factory. By the mid-60s, this made Warhol one of the most glamorous people in the world. As he was going around town with his entourage of superstars, he also developed his own glamorous persona. The most famous of the superstars was Edie Sedgwick, a high society party girl who became part of the factory crowd. She combined the rich girl's sense of style with the outgoing attitude of the 60s youth, and soon became a popular model and a fashion icon. Warhol and Sedgwick developed an identical androgynous look, painted their hair silver like the factory walls, and presented the weird yet glamorous duo, which became a fixture of the New York nightlife. Warhol displayed his fascination with glamour in his art as well, and made many paintings of Hollywood stars. In 1962, following the untimely death of Marilyn Monroe, he used the silk screen technique to create the Marilyn diptych, mass producing this icon of our time. Instantly, this image became the Mona Lisa of pop art. He did the same to other movie stars, most notably Elvis Presley. Elvis is remembered today mainly as a musical star. But back then, we should remember, music was subordinate to cinema. He was already known as the king of rock and roll, but rock and roll was still regarded as a passing fad, a youth thing. To really make it in showbiz, it was believed, you had to make it in Hollywood. Elvis's manager, Colonel Tom Parker, was busy glamorizing and mythologizing his prodigy, and as part of that he signed a long-term deal with Hollywood. In the early 60s, Elvis was no longer touring, and instead made a succession of rock and roll musicals. So when Warhol painted him, he chose an image from one of his movies, and tinted it silver. Hollywood was still the capital of glamour. But things were changing. Elvis, like Monroe, was part of a generation that was already media savvy, and knew how to manipulate the press. As part of the rock and roll generation, he also understood the mindset of this generation, and became its spokesman. Young movie actors now found themselves having to be part of this new game, in which they were required to represent their generation in the media. But on the small screen, they lost their star aura, and the focus gradually shifted to the rock and roll stars. Cinema, meanwhile, was undergoing other changes. The combined influence of European movies and method acting, and the need to display its superiority over television, made the film industry gradually move away from the star system and focus on the art of movie making. This was generally seen as a step up for cinema, but for Warhol, it meant that it lost all its magic. 
Warhol was addicted to drama, and his superstars were all drama queens. Mostly a spectator himself, he would encourage and manipulate the people around him to express their inner star and interact in interesting ways. He would carry a tape recorder with him at all times, recording the drama around him. In 1964 he bought a movie camera, and started to make his own movies by filming his superstars. To audition people for the movies, he took the old Hollywood personality test a step further, and had them sit and stare at the camera for several minutes, doing nothing. The idea was that eventually they will break, and then their true personality will be revealed. Thus, in the factory, the golden age of Hollywood was intertwined with the urban reality of the 60s. In a way, his movies continued the legacy of neorealism, as he wasn't using actors but letting people play themselves, in scenes that were largely unscripted. But while neorealism aspired to show the harsh reality hiding underneath the glamour, Warhol's movies suggest that glamour is reality. In other words, that we are all playing a part. There is at least part of you that is a manufactured construct. The Hollywood movie industry, meanwhile, was experiencing a major crisis. One of its reactions to television was to produce large-scale historical or biblical epics, where it could use the big screen to dazzle like TV never could. In 1963, the big epic of the year was Cleopatra, with Elizabeth Taylor playing the role of the Egyptian goddess queen. Taylor became the shiniest star that year, and her love affair with the Cleopatra co-star Richard Burton made them the new king and queen of Hollywood. Her Egyptian look was the one that all fashionable women tried to imitate, and Warhol made her the main object of his paintings. Cleopatra showed that Hollywood could still bring on the glamour, but it came at a huge financial cost, and this grandiosity could not be sustained for long. Cleopatra barely managed to make profit, but on the next year came the fall of the Roman Empire, a movie epic whose title became morbidly self-referential. Despite being a pretty good film, it was a resounding box office failure, marking the end of the historic epics, and practically the end of old Hollywood. The audience was clamoring for something else. By 1965, Warhol felt that the plastic arts have nothing left to say, and announced that he is retiring from painting, and dedicating himself to movie making. Art on canvas wasn't interesting anymore. It was a lot more interesting to film people who were themselves living works of art, moving and changing in a way that a painting never could. The 60s saw the rise of what was called underground cinema, independent movie makers who made low-budget films unbound by the restrictions of Hollywood. Warhol's earliest attempts were short films that showed people doing some rudimentary everyday activity, and put focus on something artists usually don't focus on. In that, they were pop art. Gradually he started to make longer movies, revolving around the personalities of the superstars, and became one of the main underground directors. Warhol's retirement from plastic arts was reflective of the times. All of the traditional art forms, which were brought to their height by European culture, suddenly felt inept to express the human spirit in this newer and faster world. Young people who had a creative mind, and revered the great artists of the past, were left wondering how they could achieve the same heights themselves. Such was the case with the young Lou Reed, a rebellious and sarcastic New York kid who hated 50s conformity, and idolized the self-destructive lifestyle of the cursed poets. He was a gifted poet himself, but felt that the traditional mediums of poetry could not give him what he wanted. He dreamt of combining his poetry with rock and roll, but this was unthinkable in the early 60s. Instead, he joined the label that produced pop records, and kept his poems to himself. The label he joined, called Pickwick International, was a truly crummy outfit specializing in creating just the type of exploitative commodities that the culture guardian stigmatized all pop music by. Something about the ersatz nature of it must have appealed to Lou's sense of irony. He took a job as a songwriter, and crafted pop pastiches that capitalized on the latest rock and roll fads. Most fads in early 60s rock and roll revolved around dance steps. After the success of The Twist, which became a huge dance craze in 1960, 
everyone was trying to invent a new dance that would sweep the nation. The lyrics usually contained instructions on how to dance it, and invitations to join in. In late 1964, Reed wrote The Ostrich, an absurd spoof that called upon the dancers to bend forward and put their head on the ground, and then step on it. The single was attributed to a fictitious band called The Primitives, and it actually found some local success among college kids. Pickwick got some invitations to perform it at dances, but the problem was, there was no band to perform it. So the heads of the label had to hastily form the primitives ad hoc. Reed was to be the singer, and they started looking for a band to back him up. Meanwhile, just a few miles away but worlds apart, there were strange noises coming out of a loft in downtown Manhattan, where Lamont Young, the most notable avant-garde composer working in New York at the time, was busy trying to go somewhat deeper than the ostrich. Young was part of the Fluxus movement, an important group of artists that sprang in the early 60s in America, Europe and the Far East, mounting an attack on the principles of modern art. Their ideas included breaking the linear motion of Western rationality, dissolving the barriers between art and real life, combining several art forms together to create multimedia happenings, and trying to become part of the flux of time. Young, in typical Fluxus fashion, relied on minimalist sound and outlandish musical concepts, and his staple was the use of elements from classical Indian music to create a sustained repetitive drone, which he extended endlessly in compositions that could go on for hours, or days, or even longer. The official name of the project was the Theatre of Eternal Music, reflecting the transcendental and everlasting nature of its compositions, but it was unofficially known as the Dream Syndicate because of the psychological effect of the trance-like drone. One member of the syndicate was violinist Tony Conrad, who had his own radical perception on what they were doing, and saw it as music that renounces the role of the composer altogether, representing the sound of the ever-flowing reality, which the musician can only divert or become part of. One evening in early 1965, Conrad and another member of the syndicate, violist John Cale, decided to take a break from all the droning, and go out on town to look for some action. They randomly walked into the first party they found, and were immediately approached by an executive type, who was impressed by their bohemian look and asked if they were musicians. When they told him that they were, in fact, musicians, he presented himself as an executive in a record label called Pickwick International, and told them that they threw the party in order to recruit members for a new rock and roll band that they are forming. Since he never bothered to ask them if they were rock and roll musicians, Conrad and Kale decided to go along with it just for the lark, and agreed to join the band. He took them to meet Lou Reed, and they finally confessed that they knew nothing of playing rock and roll guitars, but Reed informed them that it would not be a problem, since his composition demanded that all the strings in the guitars would be tuned to the same note. For Reed, this was just part of the inane spirit of the song, but Kale and Conrad were flabbergasted. This was exactly the same kind of thing that they were doing with Lamont Young, and it was coming from a shoddy rock and roll tunesmith. Conrad and Kale were intrigued by Lou's mind, and agreed to join the primitives. This is how it was in the 60s. High and low culture mixed together, fine art and pop art intertwined, and the most avant-garde ideas of fine art were something that the rock and roll kids came up with by intuition. The primitives were short-lived, and Conrad soon went back to the dream syndicate but the partnership between Reed and Cale was consolidated. John Cale was born in Wales, studied music in London and was considered a musical prodigy. In 1963 he was awarded the Leonard Bernstein Scholarship to study modern composition in the States, but his destructive approach towards musical theory was too extreme for the academy, and he dropped out and joined Young's ensemble. There he learned to play electric viola, cranking the volume up until it sounded like a jet engine, and adhered to Conrad's ideas of deconstructing the sacred role of the Western composer. But by 1965, he felt that these ideas could not be effectuated within the field of classical music. The aim of the avant-garde and the Fluxus movement was to change the Western state of mind, but it was so esoteric that it only reached a small bohemian clique, a fact that rendered the whole project futile. He didn't think much of pop music either, but when he read Lou Reed's Tough Street Poetry, he realized that he could synthesize some of his musical ideas with it, and reach a much larger audience. His encouragement got Reed to leave Pickwick and go after his original dream of fusing rock and verse, 
and the two started to orchestrate complex and poetic numbers, and decided to form a rock band. To complete the lineup, Lou brought in two more people he knew. One was a female percussionist called Maureen Tucker, who added another level of weirdness. First of all, a female drummer was an extreme rarity in those days, but on top of that she had an androgynous look, and a minimalist style that set her apart from the swaggering male rock and roll drummers. To that they added Sterling Morrison, a good guitarist who could give them the rock sound. Tucker's metronomic drumming, along with Cale's atonal viola, the ostrich one-note guitars, and Reed's nagging hypnotic singing style, created a monotonic drone that was the heart of the band sound. Building on this foundation, they would set off on their improvisations, Morrison and Reed's guitars rocking it out and Cale taking it with his bass, viola and keyboards to completely alien regions. They called themselves the Velvet Underground, a name that picked off a pulp pornographic novel that claimed to be a documentary on the sexual corruption of our age. And they certainly lived up to the name, with a dark demented sound and gritty lyrics that documented urban decay and desperation through the lives of junkies, hustlers, sexual deviants, or just regular alienated city people. Once they had their sound, they started looking for places to perform it. Towards the end of 65 they managed to get a steady gig at a Greenwich Village joint called Café Bizarre, but the owners never imagined that they would get anything that bizarre. The Velvet Underground sets were basically made out of covers of recognized rock and roll tunes, but occasionally they would slip in one of their own compositions, and drive the appalled folky crowd out of the place. Naturally, the contract was terminated after two weeks, but on one of their last shows, a fateful thing happened. A young guy called Gerard Malanga watched their performance, and was so inspired that he got on one of the tables and did a creative dance with the whip. The band was impressed and asked him to come again, and he did so on the next night, only this time he was also accompanied by his mentor, Andy Warhol. Warhol, as mentioned, had quit painting at the beginning of the year, and decided that pop art should be done through a pop medium namely cinema. But by the end of the year it was obvious that cinema has been usurped. Pop culture was now about pop music, about rock and roll. The British bands brought back its rebellious edge, combined with the sophistication of 60s pop and the stylishness of Maud London. And in America, Bob Dylan crossed over from folk to rock, giving it new power. Dylan was already famous as a folk poet, but folk was vehemently against Glamour for describing the realities of the simple working people. But in 1964 Dylan started to feel that folk is just trapped in a Marxist dogma, not really representing what the common people feel and want. He considered switching to poetry, joining the ranks of the beat poets, but he too came to the conclusion that old mediums like poetry have lost their power to make a difference. In contrast, rock and roll was the sound of the working class youth and it was changing society. In mid-65, Dylan electrified his sound adopted the flashy, glamorous and slightly androgynous persona, and created the folk rock fusion that changed the music world. After that, everything suddenly seemed possible. Prior to that, rock and roll was just about simply structured songs that were rooted in the everyday life of the youth. Now, every subject matter became legitimate, and you could structure your songs according to your own vision. A distinction was forming between rock and roll, which was seen as the juvenile style that we need to grow out of, and rock, a more serious and mature style. And with the rise of rock, a reversal occurred in popular culture. The center of gravity shifted from cinema to music, and Warhol, always in tune with the spirit of the time, started looking for a rock band to manage. When he saw the Velvet Underground, he was immediately taken by their stark coolness, their subject matter and the hermaphroditic drama. He offered to take them under his wing, and the Velvets agreed and became part of the factory. But Warhol did have one problem with the Velvet Underground as a pop art project. Lou Reed wrote great songs, but as a singer he lacked glamour. Warhol suggested to the band that they add a female lead singer, and said that he already had someone in mind, someone who recently came to him for help with her singing career. He introduced them to her, but she really needed no introduction. They all remembered her from La Dolce Vita. Nico, in 65, decided to make use of her unique voice and go into pop music. She tried her luck first on the British scene, and then came to New York and became part of the factory crowd. Now 27 and at the height of her beauty, 
she cut an imperial, cool and glamorous figure, just what the Velvets needed, and they agreed to take her on board. Warhol had his house band. Now it was time to make pop art. What Warhol did was turn the band into part of a multimedia experience which they called the Exploding Plastic Inevitable. At the center were the Velvet Underground, dressed in all black, wearing sunglasses and acting completely cool and aloof as they blasted their unique rock sound. And Nico was up front, dressed in white, a striking figure of glamour and beauty. Adding to the experience was a light show, a couple of Warhol movies screened on the wall behind the band, and Valanga and other superstars dancing and acting out scenes from the songs. For most, this was a distasteful and morbid cacophony, but the band found enough fans in New York to have a following. The next step was to take it to California. Warhol was excited about bringing the show to Hollywood, the home of glamour, but there was another reason they wanted to go. There were rumors that something very musically interesting was going on in California. It was started by Ken Kesey, an up-and-coming novelist whose debut novel, One Flew Over the Cuckoo's Nest, was a smash hit in 1962. But then, around the same time that Warhol and Dylan came to similar conclusions, Kesey announced that literature has lost its power, and that he is going to express himself through movies and rock and roll music. The thing that he wanted to express was a new kind of spirituality, induced by the use of hallucinogenic drugs. Driven by his vision, San Francisco saw the rise of acid rock, bands that played improvisational rock music accompanied by a colorful light show, with everyone dancing under the influence of acid. This was the beginning of psychedelia, and the hippie subculture. Based on hearsay, it seemed to be very close to what the exploding plastic inevitable was doing, a multimedia experience combining improvisational rock with a stunning light show, so it seemed natural to perform for the hippies. In May 1966, they brought their show to California. And it was an impasse. There may have been some superficial similarities in style, but what the Velvet Underground was doing was diametrically opposed to what the hippie acid rock bands were about. The hippie bands were about lovingly uniting with their audience, the VU were confrontational. The hippie bands were about hallucinogenic drugs, the VU were about heroin and speed. The hippie bands were about liberating the individual, the VU were about documenting the individual's self-destruction. Warhol was hoping to bask in some California glamour, but the hippies were decidedly anti-glamour. They saw it as fake, and wanted their music to be an expression of authentic humanity. A rock song, to them, was supposed to be a pure expression of the singer's soul. The Velvet Underground songs, in contrast, are theatrical, with Reed assuming characters of extremely self-destructive types of people. And this was another problem that the hippies had with the VU, as their perception of rock made them believe that Reed is actually the depraved character that he presents in his songs. The Velvets didn't complete their stint in California. They parted ways with the hippies in mutual disgust, and went back to New York. In New York, they started to work on their first album, with Warhol taking on the role of producer, and essentially, like in his movies, letting the band do whatever they want. But since he knew nothing about music distribution, it would take almost a year until the album finally saw light. In the meantime, towards the end of 66, he finally made a breakthrough in cinema, as his movie Chelsea Girls started playing in regular theaters. The movie allegedly takes place in the Chelsea Hotel, a famous hangout of New York Bohemians, and we see some of Warhol's superstars in their hotel rooms, doing their thing. Learning from the exploding plastic inevitable concerts, in which you would have two movies playing side by side, this movie is already split screen, and we see two scenes playing simultaneously, with the audio alternating between them. Eventually, the lives of the heroes get intertwined in some ways, although it's hard to say that there is any plot to the movie. The film is mostly boring, but it is a unique experience, with some interesting moments provided by the personalities of the superstars. Containing nudity, sex talk, drug use, homosexuality, and other subjects that were taboo in Hollywood cinema, the movie was sensational for its time and got banned in some places, adding to Warhol's notoriety. In April 1967, The Velvet Underground's debut album, titled The Velvet Underground and Nico, finally saw light. It is a perfect album. 
Lou Reed's songs of urban realism are realized through the incessant drone of Tucker's metronomic drumming, Kale's hypnotic electric viola, and Reed's own ostrich guitar and monotonic singing that has almost no melody. Then again, at some points the music can become very aggressive, punctuating the lyrics. And while the songs Reed sings himself are mainly about self-disintegration, the songs he wrote for Nico to sing are about people who create a character for themselves to overcome the disintegration. These songs are more melodic and pretty, serving as a much needed breather. To wrap it all up, Warhol provided the cover art which, when peeled, revealed a flesh-colored banana. From the point of view of glamour, Nico's three songs are the most interesting. Femme Fatale is about a tough and sexy woman who has been molded by the streets of New York, and is now a menace to any man, like the Femme Fatales in movies. All Tomorrow's Parties is about a girl who has no life outside of the parties she attends, and she somehow manages, with her meager means, to create dresses that would make her look glamorous in those parties. And I'll Be Your Mirror is telling those people described in the other songs, the people who are downtrodden and feel that they are ugly inside and out, that they actually have a beautiful star in them, and they just need to let it shine. Nico's somewhat disembodied vocal is perfect for delivering these songs of self-creation out of the muck. Reed wrote another song for Nico to sing, called Sunday Morning. This is another anthem for overcoming depression and making something out of yourself. But while in I'll Be Your Mirror you need someone else to be the mirror that shows you your inner star, here the singer is saying it to herself. Another beautiful song, but Lou and Nico had a falling out, and he ended up recording it himself, imitating a woman's voice. By the time the album finally saw light, in March 1967, Reed's caustic personality alienated Warhol as well. The Velvet Underground bid farewell to the factory crowd, and to the end of the decade they continued to chart their own musical path, singing about the seedier sides of urban America. It's nothing at all. Nowadays, the Velvet Underground and Nico will chart as one of the top 5 greatest rock albums of all time, no matter who makes the list. But back in 1967, it wasn't what the rock crowd was looking for. The hippies were ascendant, and their colorful and naive optimism swept rock music. The music of the Velvet Underground, and later Reed and Cale in their solo efforts, remained a curiosity for the next five years. Nico, meantime, managed to forge a solo career of her own. Her debut album contains the track Chelsea Girls, which is based on the Warhol movie. The 60s were a big party, but the last two years of the decade were when everyone paid the bill. The overthrowing of traditional inhibitions and the hedonistic lifestyle eventually led to self-destruction. One who embodied this process was Edie Sedgwick, the lively girl who was one of the symbols of the generation, but by the late 60s she was a drug addict and a total wreck. She died in 1971. It also led to ideological extremities, as exemplified by Valerie Solanas, a disturbed young woman who believed that men are responsible for all of her problems, and that they are a scourge that has to be eradicated. Warhol, naturally, was fascinated by her eccentricity, and made her part of the factory crowd. She, in turn, came to see him as a symbol of the patriarchal world, and in 1968 she came to the factory armed with a gun, and tried to assassinate him. He miraculously survived, but the atmosphere in the factory was forever sullied. 
The factory represented the carnivalesque spirit of the 60s, where everyone could freely mix together. But now the mix had radical elements in it, who could not coexist with others. That spirit was dead. In the late 60s, the rock and roll generation became political, and in some cases even violently so. It believed that it represents the truth against the fake world created by the previous generations, and that it is going to create a better world. Rock music reflected this earnestness, and attributes like glamour, irony, theatricality, humor and mischief became rare. But in the early 70s, doubt would creep in. And then, in that space that opened between rock and roll and Hollywood, between reality and celluloid dreams, between fine art and pop, between self-creation and self-disintegration, between realism and irony, and between idealism and skepticism, glam would be born. <laughs> 